Well, maybe I should begin by asking if anyone here has ever lived in North Carolina where I live. Keep your hands up in case I need an interpreter. Okay? <laughs> just ask them, what did he say? All right. Well, I just had a baby. I mean, really. I, did, I had not seen this book till I walked in tonight. And for an author, a book is a baby, a new baby. Uh, it's called A Perfect Pet for Peyton. It is a children's book on the five love languages, helping children discover their love language. And when I walked in out there and uh, Becky showed it to me, I thought, woo, I like that. You know, okay. Well, it's great to see you here tonight. And uh, I'm excited about being with you. I assume if you're here, you have children. Okay. <laughs> Or you're anticipating children, uh, or maybe you're a grandparent, you have grandchildren, but if you have grandchildren, that means you had children, right? Okay. Well, uh, I do believe that children are a gift of God, and I believe that basically all parents love their children. Maybe I should say most parents love their children. <clears throat> there are some, some parents, I think, you know, who are either mentally uh, don't have the ability to love or they, they're on drugs and alcohol and don't have the ability to love. But uh, basically, parents love their children. But the reality is that not all children feel loved. And there's a huge difference between loving children and children feeling love. So what I want to talk tonight is about how do you effectively love children. I like to picture inside every child there is an emotional love tank. And if the love tank is full, that is if they genuinely feel loved by the parents, then the child grows up normally. But if the love tank is empty and the child does not feel loved by the parents, the child grows up with many internal struggles. And in the teenage years, the child will go looking for love, typically in all the wrong places. When I wrote my original book for uh, married couples, The Five Love Languages, I included a chapter on how, how that concept applies to children. And for the next several years, I had so many parents say to me, uh, you know, Dr. Chapman, you gave us a little bit of help in that book with children, but why don't you write a book that would really kind of, sp kind of elaborate on that idea? So I teamed up with Dr. Ross Campbell, a psychiatrist, 30 years experience working with children and adolescents. And we wrote the book, The Five Love Languages of Children. And I've been super, super encouraged uh, by the response to that book and the number of parents almost every week who tell me that uh, it has really made a huge difference in the way they love their children. So what I discovered was that the same five love languages that apply in a love relationship between a husband and wife also apply in the parenting relationship between the parent and the child, and that children really do have a primary love language. And if you don't speak their primary love language, they will not feel loved, even though you are speaking some of the other languages. So I want to, uh, first of all, go through the love languages with you. Uh, they're not new to you if you've read the original book, but I wanna show you how they apply to children and I want to demonstrate to you the reality that, that the children do have a primary love language, and we want to talk about how to discover that so that you can be effective in loving your children. So let's look at it. Uh, what are the five love languages? Let's begin, it's no particular order for these, but let's begin with physical touch. We've long known the emotional power of physical touch. Uh, research has been done primarily in European orphanages that demonstrate that children who are picked up and touched tenderly develop better emotionally than children who are left for hours in a crib and no one touches them. Uh, this is why we, we encourage parents to pick up babies, to hold them, to kiss them, to cuddle them. And long before the baby understands the meaning of the word love, the baby feels love by physical touch. You remember in Mark chapter 10, when they brought the little children to Jesus and his disciples said, no, 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 this is not a kid's meeting, not a kid's meeting, it's for adults. But what did Jesus say? Bring the little children to me for of such is the kingdom of God. And the next verse says, he put his hands on them and touched them. Physical touch is a powerful communicator. Infants actually thrive on touch. 
As they get older, obviously the form of touch changes. As they get older, we're wrestling them in the floor, we're, uh, we're putting arms around them, we're kissing them, we're hugging them, uh, and, and we get older, we're playing ball with them, uh, we're giving them high fives. And let me just throw this out to fathers. Many fathers in our generation are drawing back from physically touching their pre-adolescent daughters. And I think the reason for that is we've had so much in the news about sexual abuse and, and fathers just, they, they don't want to do anything wrong. And so they kind of draw back from touching their pre-adolescent daughters. But I'm telling you, if you don't hug your pre-adolescent daughter and kiss her on the cheek, she will find a, a teenage boy three years older than her who will. So I'm encouraging you, don't draw back from touching your pre-adolescent daughter. Continue to hug and continue to kiss. And let me just say that all of these languages can, can certainly be means of expression of love to all children. So we, we're not just going to limit it to the one that's primary, but we're going to give heavy doses of that. All children need to be touched. And I want to encourage you to continue touching your pre-adolescent daughters. Uh, but for some children, Physical touch is their primary uh, uh, love language. I want to give you an example of this, and I won't do this on all of them, but uh, one of the things we did in writing the book was we talked to children themselves, and we asked them questions such as, on a scale of zero to 10, how much love do you feel from your father? Or how much love do you feel from your mother? and other questions to try to solicit that. And here's an example of children for whom physical touch is their primary language. Sophia is seven. Quote, I know my mommy loves me because she hugs me. Jeremy is a junior in college. He told us how he knew his parents loved him. Quote, they showed it all the time. Every time I left the house, as long as I can remember, I always got a hug and kiss from my mom and a hug from my dad if he was at home. And every time I came home, it was a repeat performance. It's still that way. Some of my friends can't believe my parents because they didn't grow up in, t in touching families, but I like it. I still look forward to their hugs. It gives me warm feelings inside. Obviously, for that young man, physical touch is his language. Here's an 11-year-old, a hunter, quote, uh, we ask him, on a scale of zero to 10, how much do your parents love you? Without batting an eye, he said, 10. When we ask why, uh, he said, quote, well, for one thing, because they tell me, but even more from the way they treat me. Dad is always bumping me when he walks by and we wrestle on the floor. He's lots of fun. And mom's always hugging me, although she stopped doing it in front of my friends. <laughs> Jessica is 12. She lives with her mother most of the time and visits her father every other weekend. She said that she feels especially loved by her father. When we asked why, she said, quote, because every time I go to see him, he hugs and kisses me and tells me how glad he is to see me. When I leave, he hugs me for a long time and tells me he misses me. I know my mom loves me too. She does lots of things for me but I wish she would hug me and act as excited about being with me as daddy does. You understand the difference? She's feeling more love from the father for one reason. He's giving her more physical touch, and that's obviously her primary uh, language. A second love language is words of affirmation, using words to affirm the child. Now, in all of the languages, there are different dialects, uh, much as in spoken language. Uh, all of us grow up speaking a language with a dialect. I grew up speaking English Southern style. But everyone grows up speaking a language with a dialect. So within these languages, there are different dialects. And on this particular one, I'm going to give you two or three of the dialects. I won't do that on all of them. Uh, but one of them would be words of affection. Affection. That is words that focus on who the child is. You can focus on the child's personality or on their physical appearance or on their value. But what you're trying to do is you're focusing on them. Uh, not something they've done, but just them. Uh, such things as, you are so beautiful. I love your strong muscles. I like the fact that you smile. 
You look so beautiful when you smile. You are really smart. I like the way you think. Or simply, I love you. It's just focusing on something about the child himself or herself. Words of affection. Now, when a child is an infant, it's the tone of voice that communicates love, not the words. You can say to an infant, you sweet little thing, I just love you to death. Or you can say, you little rascal, you just like your daddy. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say. It's the tone of voice. But as they get older, of course, the words themselves become extremely important. And then uh, a second dialect is words of praise. Now, this focuses on the child's effort. Great catch. Good job. You worked hard on this. But now let me remind you to always focus on effort, not on perfection. I remember I was visiting a 13-year-old boy in the hospital who had stomach ulcers. And I was trying to find out what might be going on inside of him. And I said to him in conversation, uh, what kind of relationship do you and your father have? And I was surprised by his answer. He said, I don't ever please my father. And I said, really? I said, can you give me an example? He said, if I play ball and I make a double, my father will say, you should have made a triple, boy. Can't you run? He said, if I make an, a, a B on my report card, my father will say, you should have made an A, boy. You're smarter than this. He said, if I mow the grass, my father will say, you didn't get out of the bushes, boy. I don't ever please my father. Now, I knew the boy's father, and I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying to motivate his son to give 100%. If you play ball, play ball. If you mow grass, do it right. You know the old saying, if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing right? <laughs> Your father, my father told me that. If a job's worth doing, it's worth... And I knew that's what he was trying to do. And he was trying to communicate to his son, if you're capable of making A's, don't come home with B's. He was trying to motivate his son. But do you understand what his son was hearing? I don't ever please my father. You see, the time to help a child bring a B to an A is not the day you bring the report card home. That's the day you praise them for the B. Yay, B! <laughs> it's three days after the report card is back on the teacher's desk that you say, Johnny, Mary, you know that B was really great. I wonder what we could do to bring it up to an A minus. And they're with you. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Dr. Chapman, I could do that if it were a B. <laughs> but it's kind of hard to praise a kid for a D. Well, do you know that a D is better than a D minus? And a D minus is better than an F? Yay, D! Woo, that's good, man! And it's three days later, you say, I wonder how we could bring that D up to a D plus next time. <laughs> And, and the time to teach a child how to stretch a double into a triple is not the day he hits the double. It's next Saturday when you say to him, you know, son, sometimes you can stretch a double into a triple and you can show him how to run and slide into third base. And if you don't break your ankle, you can teach him how to do it. <laughs> and the time to teach a child how to get the grass under the bushes is not the day he finishes mowing the grass. That's the day you praise him for all the grass that has been mowed. Woo, look at all this grass lying flat. Man, you did a good job. It's next Saturday, you say. Son, you see this grass under the bushes? It's hard to get. You have to go in and out, but I know you can do it. You bet he will. Are you with me? You reward children for effort. Now, you see, we do this when they're little. You remember when your child was learning how to walk? And they held on to the chair, and you got two feet away and said, that's right, come on, you can walk, come on, you can walk, come on, come on, you can walk. And they take half a step and fall. Now, what do you say when they fall? You don't say, you dumb kid, can't you walk? <laughs> we say, yay! And what happens? They get up and try again. We rewarded their effort. 
So when you're praising children, you don't praise them for perfection. You praise them for effort. And incidentally, ladies, this works really well with your husband. <laughs> and all the guys are saying, amen. <laughs> you see, you walk into a, the, the room of a six-year-old and you tell them, you tell him, let's say, to pick up your toys and put them in the toy box. And you go back in 10 minutes and seven toys are in the box and five are on the floor. What are you going to say? I told you to get these toys up, boy. I get them up now. Why not? Yay! Seven in the box. And I bet the other five will jump in the box. You see, praising children for effort is a far more powerful way to motivate them and to communicate love to them. And then a third dialect of words is words of encouragement. The word encourage means to instill courage. You're trying to give them the ability, the motivation to attempt to do more. Such things as, that's close, man. You almost got it. You're almost there, man. That's good. Hey, you got it. Or I noticed the way that you shared your clay with Mary. It was really neat, man. I love it when you share. Or, you know, I noticed the way you went over and encouraged Mark after he missed that shot. I know he must have felt badly, and I really appreciate that about you, that you went over there and gave him a word of encouragement. You are encouraging him to do something that you believe to be worthwhile. So what you're doing is trying to catch your children do th doing things that you would like to build into their character, and you affirm them for that, and it encourages them to do that even more. And let me just say this out, one little guideline on the words, I love you, because these are words of affirmation. They're probably the most common words of affirmation. But the words, I love you, to a child should always stand alone. It should not be, I love you, will you do this for me? It should not be, I love you, but I'll tell you right now. It should not be, I love you when you clean up your room. I love you when you make good grades. Or I love you, I would love you if you would break up with that creep you're dating. <laughs> no, the message is, I love you no matter what. I don't always like what you do, but I will always love you, and I will always be here for you. You see, again, we can, we can do, say that when they're young, but when they get to be 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, we don't always like what they're doing, and we have a hard time saying simply, I love you, I will always love you. It's okay to say, I don't like what you're doing. It's okay to say that to a 14-year-old or 15-year-old, but I will love you, and I will always be here for you. You see, if they sense that in their heart, when they get into trouble, they will come to you because they know in their heart you, you will love them no matter what they've done. If they don't have that sense, then when they get in trouble, they will go to their friends or, or somebody else for help because they don't think that you'll be there for them. Uh, let me give you an example of this, uh, f children for whom this is their primary language. Uh, Melissa is eight. She said, quote, I love my mother because she loves me. Every day she tells me that she loves me. I think my father does too, but he never tells me. For that gal, words is her primary language. Taylor's 12. She broke her arm this year. Quote, I know that my parents love me because when I was having uh, such a hard time keeping up with my schoolwork, they encouraged me. They never forced me to do homework when I wasn't feeling well, but told me I could do it later. They said how proud they were that I was trying so hard and that they knew I would be able to keep up. You see, words of encouragement were powerful to her. David is an active, outspoken five-year-old, confident that his parents love him. Quote, my mama loves me and my daddy loves me. Every day they say, I love you. John is 10. He's been in foster homes since he was three. 
For the past eight months, he has lived with Doug and Betsy, his fourth set of foster parents. When he was asked if they, gen if they genuinely loved him, he said they did. We asked why he said that so quickly, quote, because they don't yell and scream at me. My last foster parents yelled and screamed all the time. They treated me like trash. Doug and Betsy treat me like a person. I know I have lots of problems, but I also know they love me. Words can be powerful to a child. As a matter of fact, the book of Proverbs says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. You can kill a child or you can give a child life by the way you talk to them. And incidentally, the same thing is true with your spouse. Ladies, when you give your husband a positive word, there's something inside of him that wants to be better. And when you give him a critical word, there's something inside of him that wants to shoot you. <laughs> a third love language is quality time. Giving the child your undivided attention, quality time. If you mothers and fa our fathers ever had this experience, you're, uh, you're making potato salad and your three-year-old son or daughter comes and says, hey, mommy, hey, daddy, come, come to my room, daddy. I want, I want to show you something. I want, or, or let's go play, daddy. Let's go play. And you say, okay, well, let me finish the potato salad and then I, we'll go play. And they come back in two minutes. My mommy, come on, come on, let's play, mommy. Let's play, dad. And you say, okay, honey, just give me, let me finish the potato salad. And they come back four or five times. They're begging for quality time. Now, wouldn't it be better to give the child quality time and then say, now mommy or daddy has got to go fix the potato salad. And because you fill their love tank, they'll let you fix the potato salad in peace. Or a father is, is sitting there, uh, comes home, and he's sitting there reading the newspaper, or he's working on his computer, and the kid comes and says, hey, daddy, come, okay, dad's come, dad's come, you know. And, and the daddy says the same similar thing, you know. You know. And, and then what happens eventually? They jump into the paper. They, or they jump on your computer. They, they're, they're begging you for quality time. Uh, so far better to give them quality time if you know that this is their language. The important thing is not what you are doing. The important thing is that the child has your undivided attention. When they're little, and let me just say this, that you have to go to where the child is in order to give them quality time. So when they're little, it means you go to the floor because that's where they are. You remember this? You're sitting on the floor and you have your legs spread and they're over there and you have a ball and you say, Whee! That's right. Whee! That's right. Good. Whee! That's right. Good. Whee! You run a million dollar business, but right now this child has your undivided attention. Now, if the telephone rings and you start talking on the phone while you roll the ball, the child no longer has your undivided attention. Now, as they get older, again, you go to where they are. It may be the sandbox. It may be tricycles, it may be bicycles, it may be ball, but you go to where they are. They cannot come to where you are. And if you're going to spend quality time, you have to go to where they are. Now, this may involve quality conversation. That's one of the dialects, quality conversation. Uh, you're not just giving them undivided attention in a game. You are actually having a conversation with them. You know, we often miss opportunities for conversation by the way we respond to a child. For example, a child brings home their art piece from school and, you, and they want you to see it and you look at it and say, oh honey, that's beautiful. Oh, I love the colors. Oh, you did a good job with that. Now all of those are words of affirmation. They're all good. But when you get through with the praise, the conversation's over. There really was no conversation. It was a monologue. But if you said to the child, after you've said those affirming words, honey, what were you thinking when you drew this? Or what were you feeling when you drew this? They'll tell you. I was thinking about last summer when we were at grandmother's house and had a picnic under the tree. And this is the dog. Remember, he ate my hot dog. 
I didn't like him at first, but I like him now. And they go on to tell you about their picture and what they were thinking, what was in their mind and what they were feeling. And then you can interact with them and you're having a conversation. So you have to make conversation with children. They, they, they're willing to enter into it, but we have to be thinking conversation. Storytelling is another way to spend quality time with children. Storytelling. They can be real stories. They can be Bible stories. Or you can make up stories. I remember when our kids were little, we have a son and a daughter. I remember when they were little, I had this whole series of stories I used to tell about a man named Squirrel and a squirrel named Man. <laughs> uh, you can go a lot of places with that. Uh, but you, everybody has the ability to tell stories. And they also love to hear when you were a little boy and when you were a little girl and what your mother did and those, all those kind of things. It's wonderful opportunities uh, in telling your story to your kids to spend quality time with them. Now, you know, when they're little, we don't have a whole lot of trouble of going where they are. But when they get to be teenagers, we don't always want to go where they are. <laughs> But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to spend time with your teenager, you have to go to where they are. I remember when our son got into Buddy Holly. Anybody here old enough to remember Buddy Holly? <laughs> okay, okay. But he got into Buddy Holly. When he got into Buddy Holly, I got into Buddy Holly. I mean, I read all of his songs. I picked out the lyrics I liked, and I would say, man, Derek, I love this. Listen to this line, man. This is great. And uh, then one day... I said to him, I said, Derek, I've got to go to Fort Worth, Texas to do a seminar. How would you like to go with me? And when, we get, when I get through, you and I can drive out to Lubbock and we can explore Buddy Holly's hometown. Oh, Dad, I love that. I had no idea how far it was from Fort Worth to Lubbock. <laughs> it's a long ride and there's nothing out there but tumbleweed and railroad tracks but a whole lot of time with my son mm, in the car alone. And we went to the Chamber of Commerce. They gave us a whole list on Buddy Holly. We went out to the house where Buddy Holly lived, where he, actually where he was born. Actually, the house was gone, but the lot was still there. I took a picture of my son on the lot where Buddy Holly's house used to be. <laughs> we went to the school where Buddy Holly went. We went to the church where Buddy Holly was married and where they had his funeral. And, and, and we just, we covered the whole place. I mean, and then we got to the cemetery, and I, I kind of backed off and let Derek have a little private time, you know. <laughs> and then we get in the car, and we drive back to Fort Worth talking about, wonder what would have happened if Buddy Holly had lived and hadn't died in that plane crash. Wonder if Buddy Holly really was a Christian. Uh, his youth director really felt like he was. And, and you know, we just, you know, we, now folks, I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> I wasn't concerned about Buddy Holly. He was dead. <laughs> I was concerned about my son. And if he's going where Buddy Holly is, then I'm going with Buddy Holly. You know, you, you get, and then later he got into Bruce, and we went to Freeport, New Jersey, to discover Bruce's hometown. And eventually in college, he got into the symphony. And that's when I learned what an oboe is. Are you with me? If you go to where your kids are, you can walk with them through those teenage years, and you can spend quality time with them. But if you draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going there, then they go there with somebody else. So I encourage you to spend quality time with your kids all along the way. Then uh, number four is receiving gifts. Gifts. I uh, mentioned earlier that my academic background, undergrad and, and a master's degree is in anthropology, cultural anthropology. We have never discovered a culture where gift giving is not an expression of love. It's universal to give gifts as an expression of love. The gift says, he was thinking about me. Look what he gave me. Now the gifts need not be expensive. Haven't we always said it's the thought that counts? But I remind you, it's not the thought left in your head. It's the gift that came out of the thought in your head. How many mothers have ever received a dandelion from your kids? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it didn't cost anything, but that kid was thinking about you and brought you that dandelion. You can pick up a stone in a city parking lot and take it home and give it to an eight-year-old boy and say, hey, man, look what I found today. 
I thought about you. Look at those colors in there, man. I wanted you to have this. I can almost guarantee you, you'll find it in their dresser drawer when they're 23. And they'll remember the day you gave it to them. It doesn't have to be expensive gifts. Uh, I was in Germany some time ago. Uh, actually, I was, I was there with, with NATO. And I had a free afternoon. And I was just kind of walking around the base. And I noticed a young man. He appeared to be 13, maybe. He was sitting on a park bench by himself. And uh, so I just kind of walked up to him and, and started talking to him. And uh, I noticed he had around his neck a, 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 a St. Christopher medallion. I didn't know what it was, but I noticed he had a medallion. And so I said to him, I said, uh, well, what, uh, what's your medallion? Uh, he said, it's St. Christopher. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, my father gave it to me uh, before he was deployed. And he told me to wear it and remember him. I said, oh, that's neat. I said, who was St. Christopher? He said, uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was some saint in the church. <laughs> you see, it was obvious to me it didn't have a lot of religious significance, but it had a whole lot of emotional significance because his father gave it to him, see? and he was wearing it. So gifts can be powerful communicators. Now, let me throw this in. Even if your child's love language is gifts, you don't give them everything they want. <laughs> You're the parent. By and large, parents are older than children <laughs> and thus wiser than children. You don't give them everything they want. God doesn't give us everything we want. He's our father. He loves us, but he doesn't give us everything we want. Had he done that for me, I'd have married the wrong woman because I, I told him which one I wanted. <laughs> And she, she walked away, you know. Uh, God, thank God he doesn't give us everything we ask for. Uh, you know, a kid may want three cookies you know, or three candy bars for lunch, but you're the parent. What we do is we give them what we believe is good for them, what we believe will enhance their life. And with today's world and all the stuff they see on television advertised and everything that all their friends have, they can bombard you with things that they've got to have because everybody else has it. You don't give children things just because everybody else has it. You're assessing whether this would be good for your child or not be good for your child. And uh, because if, if gifts is their language, it, 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 how much it costs and what it is is relatively unimportant. It's the fact that you give them, uh, you give them gifts. Now sometimes parents don't get emotional credit for the gifts they give because they don't present them as gifts. For example, in the fall, uh, most parents will buy their children some school supplies when school starts, even sometimes buy them clothes, new clothes. But they don't present them as gifts. The clothes, they clip off the tags, put them in the washer, fold them up and put them in the drawer. And the school supplies, they just put in the backpack or whatever and there's your school supplies. And the kid doesn't perceive it as a gift. It's just something that fell out of heaven, you know, into their drawers. Why not wrap them up, put a bow around them, give them out in the presence of the family, make it a big deal. And the, and it, and, and the kid gets the sense they're giving me something. And let me just say this. The word gift comes from the Greek word charis, which means grace, grace, unmerited favor. A gift is not something you give a child because they did something for you. You give, the, you give it to the child simply because you love them. It's unmerited. You see, if you say to your, uh, to your child, I'll buy you that new ball if you'll clean your room. That's not a gift. That's payment for services rendered. <laughs> the little boy next door will do that for you. No, no. A gift is not something that you give a child because they did something to please you. A gift is something you give them simply because you love them. It's not based on a child's performance, but it's simply because you love them. Uh, and let me just throw this out. Don't, and this is particularly for, for parents that, uh, that are living apart and you're sharing the custody of a child. Don't try to buy the affection of your child by giving them gifts. 
This is most often by the non-custodial parent who doesn't see the child very much, but when they do, they shower them with gifts that the custodial parent cannot afford. And it's an effort to kind of make up for the hurt they've brought in the child's life and it almost never works. But far better to find out the child's primary love language, speak that language, and don't think that buying kids things will, will take care of, you know, uh, healing in their lives because it doesn't. Uh, then number five is acts of service. Acts of service. This involves doing things for our children. Now, we, we start this and we speak this language from the day they're born, serving them. We put the food in and we take the food out. <laughs> if you don't, they will die. <laughs> so we do this from the very, very beginning. Acts of service should then be appropriate to the age. You know, when they're, when they're just learning to eat with a spoon, it's okay for you to fly the food into their mouth like a, like a plane, you know, on the, whoop, good, yeah, whoop, good. That's okay, that's okay when they're learning, but they, you shouldn't be doing that when they're five, you know. We, we first of all do things for them they cannot do for themselves, and then as they get older, we teach them how to do things for themselves, and that is also an act of service. Six-year-olds can make up their own bed if you teach them how to do it. There's a whole lot of things at every age that they can do for themselves if you teach them how to do it. Now, I don't have to tell you that it often takes more time and energy to teach a child how to do something than it does to do it for them. And that's why some parents do everything for their children until they're 18 years of age. They send them off to the university and they don't know how to do anything. I mean, Wake Forest University is in our city, and when I had our college ministry and directed it years ago, we would go out on campus and, and meet every freshman student. We'd go to the dorms, and we'd knock on the door, and we'd say, we're from the name of our church, and we're just visiting on the dorms and welcoming uh, freshmen to campus. You got a few minutes to talk. And we never had anybody turn us away because freshmen are looking for somebody to talk to them. <laughs> and, uh, but you know what I found? Six weeks into the first semester, something happens that's never happened in their whole life, especially if they're guys. All their clothes get dirty at the same time. <laughs> they're all piled up at the end of the bed, and you can smell them before you see them. And his mother never taught him how to run a washing machine. And finally, some guy will come along and say, hey, man, come on. We've got washing machines down here. He, come on, I'll show you how it works. So he takes him down there and shows him where you put the quarters in, where you put the, the, the soap in. But he walks off too soon. And the young guy puts it all in there together, the black and the green and the white, and, the, and, and they all come out orange. And then he says, what's wrong with your water down here in North Carolina? Yeah. Folks, they don't teach you how to run a washing machine at the university. You've got to learn that at home. That's why I suggest to parents at some juncture along the way, you sit down and make out a list of what you'd like for your child to be able to do by the time they're 18. And if they're, and if they're teenagers, you let them help you. What, what would they like to learn by the time they get ready to leave home? And then you begin operating on that list at whatever age they are. And your, your objective is that by 18, I want them to be able to make it on their own because they're going to be out there on their own at the university. And incidentally, you have to teach them how to make decisions because they're going to make decisions at the university. And that's why I suggest to parents way down here, you start teaching children how to make decisions. And one of the best ways is to give them options. You know, you say, Johnny, uh, uh, you want to bring your tricycle in before we eat or after we eat? Either one of the decisions is going to be fine with you but you're letting the child make decisions and they get a feel for making decisions, okay? And then you also let them know that, uh, that there, there are guidelines and rules. If you don't bring your tricycle in or your bicycle in at night and you leave it out overnight, then you can't ride it the next day. That's a fair rule, isn't it? And so they left it out. You don't go screaming at them and say, better get out there and get your bicycle. <laughs> you told them the rule. 
Just let it ride. And the next day, they don't get to ride the bicycle. They won't miss but one day. They'll bring the bicycle in. So you're teaching them that with every decision, there are consequences. So we, we express love to them by acts of service, doing things for them, and then teaching them how to do things for themselves. And uh, the good part about this is for the parent, as they get older, it gives you a whole lot of help. You don't have to do all the vacuuming and all the everything, you know. You, you, and, 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 you know, anybody, anybody here still cook? <laughs> yeah, my son didn't get married until he was 34. And people would ask him, when are you going to get married? He said, you know, when you grow up in the home of a marriage counselor, you're very careful. <laughs> but he came to me about six months after he got married. He said, Dad, I got a bonus when I married Amy. I said, really? He said, yeah, Dad, she cooks. I never thought I'd find a girl that cooked. And then my daughter married a man that cooks. So my kids got it made. Yeah. <laughs> and now our granddaughter's 13. And this year she said, she called us and said, I want you, you and, and mama to come down. And she said, uh, I'm going to cook Thanksgiving for you. 13. You know, the, my, my daughter and her husband, they don't let the kids watch a whole lot of TV, but she can watch the cooking channel, you know. <laughs> And her father's a real good cook, and he's taught her to cook, and, and, now, and he's teaching the boy to cook. Man, I'm going to have great grandkids. When they get married, that, somebody's going to get a bonus in those kids. They're going to be able to cook. And yes, it takes a lot of time to do that. But uh, it's one of the love languages of people, of children. Okay, now let's uh, talk about how you discover a child's love language, our primary love language. One is that you observe how they express love to you. You can learn a child's love language by the time they are three or four. My son's love language is physical touch. When I would come home in the afternoon at about three, he would run to the door and grab my leg, and if I picked him up, fine. And when I sat down on the couch, he would get on me. He'd mess up my hair. He'd wrestle with me. He's touching me because he wants to be touched. Our daughter never did that. When she was three or four and I would come home, she would say, Daddy, come into my room. I want to show you something. Come into my room, Daddy. I want to show you something. She was asking for quality time. So you can pick it up by observing how they express love to you. Secondly, how do they express love to other people? How do they express love to other people? Uh, such as grandparents or pe kids that come over to play with them or kids that in, are in their class if they, if they go to church, to a, to a Bible cl a class at church, uh, or as they get older, their teachers. If they are always wanting to take the teacher a gift, it's a pretty good sign that gifts is their language. If they are always offering to help people do things, that's a sign that that's their love language. So you observe how they express love to you and how they express love to other people. Then number three, what do they request most often? What do they request most often? If they're saying, can we take a walk after dinner? They're asking you for quality time. Or, would you bring me a surprise when you go to the store? <laughs> They're asking you for gifts. If they say, did I do a good job? They're asking you for words of affirmation. So what do they request most often? And then, what do they complain about? The complaint also reveals the love language. The seven-year-old who says... We don't ever go to the park anymore since the baby came. It's telling you, you used to give me quality time. The two of us used to go to the park, but we don't do that since the baby came. If you, uh, if you go on a trip and come home and the child says, you didn't bring me anything? They're telling you that gifts is their language. If they say, mommy, my doll dress is still torn. They're telling you that acts of service is their language, and they ask you if you could fix the doll dress and you haven't done it. If, if you hear a child say, I don't ever do anything right, 
They're telling you that words of affirmation is their language. So you listen to their complaints. Children's complaints reveal the heart. They're telling you what makes them feel loved. Incidentally, this is a wonderful clue to your spouse's love language. What do they complain about? If your wife says to you, we don't ever spend any time together anymore. Now, what do we say? We get defensive usually. What do you mean don't spend any time together? Went out to dinner last Thursday night. <laughs> but if your spouse says we don't ever spend any time together, they're telling you that quality time is their language. Or if they say, I don't think you would ever touch me if I didn't initiate it. They're telling you that physical touch is their language. You say, we get defensive, but really they're giving us valuable information. And then uh, give them choices between two options. Uh, you say to an uh, eight-year-old, you know, I got a free hour this afternoon, and we could either go over to the mall and I could get that whatever it is that they've been wanting, or you and I could take a walk in the park. Which would you rather do? If they choose the ball, it's gifts. If they choose the park, it's quality time. And you give them choices between the two. And you keep a record of them. And you'll see that their, their choices will fall into a category. So it's another way of, of determining their, their language. And then you can experiment. Uh, and what I mean by that is, if, you, if, you, if you're really having trouble discovering a child's language, th this, this will help you. Both of you focus for one week on pouring on one love language. Let's say words, this is our week for words of affirmation. We're going to give the child words of affirmation. And then over the weekend, you back off. And next week, you give another love language. And the week that you're speaking their primary love language, you'll see a radical difference in that child's demeanor and behavior and their spirit. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll just be obvious to you. Experiment. Uh, and then, okay, I'll come to that. Uh, but I noticed in the, in the new edition of the book, and this, this, is, this is a new edition of this book, uh, they have put a little uh, uh, mystery game in the back for kids. Now, obviously, they have to, they, this wouldn't be for three-year-olds, uh, but it's called the Love Language Mystery Game, and it's 20 different uh, couplets uh, that the child uh, can, uh, can uh, respond to, like uh, two comments that, pa that parents sometimes make to their children, such as, uh, give me a hug. A parent will say, give me a hug. And, uh, or a parent may say, you're, you're terrific. But if you could only have one of those, which one would you take? A hug or your parents saying you're terrific? And you make choices, and at the end of it, the kid can actually add up the score, and it tells them their love language, tells you their love language, okay? So it's really not that difficult to determine a child's love language. Now, I want to say a word about how this affects discipline uh, of a child. First of all, you will have less discipline if a child's love tank is full, because much of the misbehavior of children grows out of an empty love tank. You see, when children don't feel loved, they, they are, they are going to do things that are designed to get attention from you. Uh, school teachers know that the children who are always acting up in class, often it's because they're trying to get attention that they don't have. And so you're going to have less discipline. Uh, much of the misbehavior of children grows out of an empty love tank. Not, not all of it, to be sure. I'm not saying that if you fill their love tank, you'll have a perfect child. No. Children are going to, do, going to do wrong. But, and also much of the misbehavior of adults comes out of an empty love tank. When you don't feel loved in a marriage, you're far more likely to get into something that's not healthy. And that's why it's important in a marriage to keep the love tank full. So you'll have less discipline. And then secondly, you'll have better discipline because you will, you will understand that when you take a child's primary love language and you use the negative form of that, you are giving that child severe punishment. And many parents don't understand this. For example, uh, if words of affirmation is your child's primary language and your main method of discipline is yelling at the kid, 
That is severe punishment. That's like a dagger to that child's heart. Whereas another kid, you could yell at them and it kind of goes like water off the duck's back. Physical touch. If a child's language is physical touch and your method of discipline is to always spank them, that's severe discipline to that child. Whereas another child that physical touch is not their language, they will actually say to you sometimes, why don't you spank me? <laughs> yeah? Or quality time. If quality time is their primary language and your main method of discipline is isolating them, that's severe punishment for that child because you're isolating them. Whereas other children, you put them in their room or in the corner, they go in there and have fun. <laughs> it's no discipline at all. So what I'm saying is that if you understand this concept, it will help you give better discipline. Now, I'm not opposed to, uh, to, to isolating a child, but what I'm saying is, even if their language is quality time, but it should be a big crime because that's big punishment. You see, if, if they're not, what's the purpose of discipline? It's to correct the child. We're not trying to hurt the child. We're trying to correct the child. Same reason God disciplines us. So if, if none of the other methods of discipline are getting their attention, turning them around, then isolating that child will probably get their attention and turn them around because it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge punishment. So it'll help you do better discipline if you understand this concept. And then uh, it'll be more productive discipline. That is, they're more likely to receive it in a positive way. Uh, let, me, let me also throw this out, and, and this, this, is, this fits in here. If you will wrap your discipline in love, the child is more likely to receive it in a positive way and change the behavior. Now, here's what I mean by that. Let's say that you have a rule that we don't throw the ball inside the house. And if you do throw the ball in the house, then the ball has to go in the trunk of the car for two days. And if you break something when you throw the ball, you'll have to pay for that out of your allowance. Is that a pretty fair deal? Okay, so you understand that, the child understands that. So let's say the child throws the ball in the house and, and breaks a, a glass or whatever. Now, if you will wrap the discipline in love, let's say their language is words of affirmation. So you say to Johnny, you know, Johnny, one of the things I like about you is you so seldom break the rules. I really like that about you. But you know you broke the rule this time, and you threw the ball in the house. So you know what has to happen, right? The ball has to go in the trunk. And you know they will have to pay for the glass out of your allowance. But listen, I am so proud of you because you so seldom break the rules. Johnny walks away feeling, I deserve that. That was right. But let's say you don't wrap it in discipline. And, you, and Johnny throws the ball and breaks the glass, and you say, Johnny, you know you're not supposed to throw the ball in the house? Now give me the ball. And you go put it in the trunk of the car for two days, and you're going to have to pay for that glass. And Johnny walks away, and he's thinking, I try so hard, and I messed up one time, and I get clobbered. Are you, you understand what I'm saying? If the child feels loved, they're more likely to receive the discipline in a positive way. Now, parents say, well, Dr. Chapman, how about gifts? You mean you're going to give them two gifts? On, well, you, a kiss, a candy kiss on the front end and something, a stone on the other end. <laughs> it doesn't have to be anything big, but we're, we're just trying to communicate to the child that we love the child, but we have to discipline the child. See, the truth is God disciplines us because God loves us. And that's why we discipline our children because we love our children. We want them to learn to live within boundaries. We want to learn them to grow up to be responsible. And therefore we have guidelines for them. And incidentally, and we discuss this in the book, uh, the best discipline is what I just described, that everybody knows the rules very clearly, what they are. And everybody knows what's going to happen if you break the rule. If you, don't, if you haven't spelled out what's going to happen if they break the rule, then it's just, it just depends on your attitude at the moment. 
And if you're in a happy attitude, you might even let it slip and nothing's going to happen. And if you're in a bad attitude, then you might come down and hit them with a thousand dollars worth of punishment for a nickel's worth of crime just because of your, your, where you were. But if, if everybody knows what the rules are and everybody knows what's going to happen if you break the rules, then it doesn't matter whether mama's at home or daddy's at home, the discipline's going to be the same and the child already knows what it's going to be. And, and it, it, that, that's the way life works. I mean, that's what God did, is it not? He says, don't do this and do this. If you do this, here's what's going to happen. So that, that's the way all of life is. So you have, you have much, better, much better discipline if the child feels loved. Uh, okay, let, let me say a word about teenagers. How many of you have teenagers? Okay, and how many of you anticipate someday having teenagers? <laughs> okay, if you have children, I hope you anticipate that, okay? So let me just say a word about teenagers. Uh, I don't know if you understand that in this country, we did not have teenage culture until the Great Depression. I'm not talking about the more recent depression. I'm talking about the one in the 30s. Before the Great Depression, all teenagers worked. They worked on the farm or they worked in the factory. And usually they worked 11 or 12 hours in the factory. And there was no teenage culture. But when the Great Depression came along, all the teenagers lost their jobs. And they were hanging around in city parks and getting into all kinds of trouble. So what did our nation decide to do? Start the public high school. Up until that time, most people went to only the eighth grade. Only the rich people went to high school. We started the public high school. And the purpose of the public high school was to teach the children a trade and to build character. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> but we isolated the teenagers. We pulled them out of the culture and put them for several hours a day by themselves. And what happened? They developed their own culture, their own music, their own language, their own dress, and all the rest of it. That's where teenage culture came from. Just a little tidbit for you, okay? But now let's look at what happens to teenagers uh, just briefly. Uh, the differences between uh, teenagers and children. And the differences, really, some of the differences between our generation of teenagers and the generation of teenagers a couple of ge uh, generation back. Uh, all teenagers are moving toward independence. And this is good. I mean, I hope you have in your mind as a parent that we've got 18 years to bring this child to a level of independence. Because at 18, typically, they're going to go to the university, or they're going to join the military, or they're going to get a job, we hope, in our culture. So you've got to be thinking independence. Well, in the teenage years, they are moving toward independence. And that's why they don't always want to go with you to family gatherings, and they don't always want you to be with them when they go shopping. They're, they're, they're going through this process of pulling away from you and being independent. And sometimes parents get shaky about this and feel like, you know, they don't like us. And it's just a part of the process, okay? And uh, still, it doesn't mean you let them do everything they want to do, but you recognize we're going to give them more independence uh, because that's, that's, uh, that's where they're moving. They're also developing logical thinking. We sometimes say they're argumentative, and they sometimes are. But what they are doing is developing logical thought. And that's why they will say to you, well, that's not right. And they will give you arguments. <laughs> you know, they, they, they can, they're, they're beginning to learn how to think logically now. And, they can, and that's why some parents say, I think he's going to be a lawyer. Because he's, you know. <laughs> but that all, all, all teenagers are going through this. And they're learning how to think logically. And consequently, they're going to question things that before they've always just accepted. But right now, they're beginning to question those things. And this is why in the religious area, they will ask you questions that they never asked when they were younger. And, and I hope that you'll just be honest with them and, and listen to the question. Don't say, well, you shouldn't be asking questions like that. Listen to the question. And if you can give an answer, give an answer. If you can't, you say, you know, that's a good question. I don't have a good answer for that. I think I'll talk with Ju to Justin about that one. <laughs> and, and, or I'll talk to somebody, but I'll see what we can find. That's a good question. 
Uh, so you receive their questions because you recognize that they're beginning to develop logical thought. And you, let, you think with them. You think you go right with them on that, on the logical thing. And, 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 and then say to them, you know, what, what if you're right? And what if everybody operated that way? How would that impact culture? How would that impact our family? Because sometimes if, they're, if their thinking is illogical, you can help them discover that it's illogical. But we want to help them develop a logical thinking, and that's, that's a positive thing. And then they are searching for their identity. They are asking themselves inside, who am I? Am I a student? Am I a ball player? Who am I? It's a question that all teenagers are wrestling with. And what you say to them can influence them greatly. Uh, our son went off to college and he made uh, C's and B's. And he, in high school, he made B's. And his, third, his second year in college, he took a philosophy course and made an A. And it blew his mind. And he came home and he said, Dad, I like this stuff. He said, I think I might major in this. And he started making A's in all of his classes. And one day I said to him, Derek, do you have any idea what happened to you? I said, you know, you made B's in high school. You made C's and B's your first year. And now you're making straight A's in everything. And he told us something that we had never, ever heard him say. He said, Dad, when I was in the fifth grade, my teacher said to me, well, Derek, I, I just guess you're not a student like your sister because the teacher had had his sister two, two or three years before. You're not a student like your sister. So I said, I just figured, well, I'm not a student. So I'm going to play ball. So he played basketball. He's real good in basketball. You understand? His identity was he was a ball player. He was not a student. And he got that from one statement from a teacher. You're not a student. So he decided, I'm a ball player. So what we say to, to students, the comments we make, and sometimes we forget we even said it, and they remember it for years. So they are, they're, they're searching for self-identity. And then their, their emotions are fluctuating. That is, a parent, parents say to me, Dr. Chapman, I don't understand. You know... Uh, my, my, my son's love language is physical touch. And, but now half the time when I touch him, he, he pushes me away and said, don't touch me. And I don't understand what's going on here. And I said, their emotions are going like this. And a good guideline on the physical touch thing, if he comes up close to you and asks you a question and stands real close to you, then you can assume that you can hug him if that's his language. But if he's standing on the other side of the room asking you the question, that's not the time to hug him. He's, it's a clue. And so at, that's why in the morning they can be one way, in the afternoon and evening they can be a different way because they're going through all these, all these flu, um, fluctuations. And then they're coping with all the physical changes that are taking place in their life. All the development of the body and the sexual organs and all of that's taking place and they're trying to make sense out of all of that. Uh, so, so we have to understand that the teenage years are some of the most traumatic years in one's life, and they're going through all of these things. And now we have, are trying to love them while they're going through all of this and keeping their love tank full. And so many, many parents have said to me, uh, Dr. Chapman, when they get to be teenagers, does their love language change? Because I know my child's love language. I've been speaking it. It was working wonderful when they were children. Now I'm doing the same thing I've always done, and it's not working. They're pushing me away. They don't want it. And they asked me, does the love language change? And my answer is, no, I don't think the love language changes, but you have to learn new dialects. Because what you have been doing they consider to be childish. And they're not kids now. And so you have to learn new dialects. If, for example, when, they, you know, when they're little down here, you're hug, physical touch is their language, and you hug them and kiss them, 
and now they're teenagers and you're trying to hug and kiss them and they're pushing you away. That's kid stuff. They still need touch, but it has to be more adult touches, like elbows, like pats on the back, like high fives, like wrestling them to the floor, you, new dialects. And if, if words is their language, and you, you were tell, tell them when they were little, you're my, you're my sweet little boy, I love you so much, and, da, 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 da. and they, they don't want to hear that stuff now. You've got to use more adult words to them now. So whatever the language, uh, you have to change the dialect when they get to be teenagers if you want to, if you want to stay connected to them. Uh, I'm going to close with this, but I tried to analyze behind the scenes, underneath the surface, what are the elements of a child or a teenager feeling loved? And here, here are the three things that I think uh, go into that. Uh, yeah, the ingredients of love. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, one of them is connection. One aspect of love is the child feels connected. Connected. Uh, this is why I think sharing meals together as a family is so important. It is one of the ways that we feel connected to the family. And in today's world... Uh, this is happening less and less because we're running to this ball game and that ball game and this piano practice and this, this, and this, and this, and this, and families don't have any time together to be connected. Uh, for us, because we were committed to this, it meant we had to change the, the evening meal time, you know, sometimes four o'clock, sometimes eight o'clock, depending on what was going on, but we still, we still had the meal together. And our kids look back and say to us that one of the fondest memories they have of childhood was that we, the meals we had together because we also talked when we had meals. TV's off, radio is off, computer is off. <laughs> this is family. We talk to each other. We share what's going on in our lives. I remember when they were in college, they would bring their kids, their college friends home for for, uh, to visit for weekends, and, and many of their friends could not believe that we'd sit around the table and talk for an hour after the meal. Connection is a huge part of feeling love. And then acceptance. Acceptance. And this is where we, we, we struggle sometimes because we don't always like what they're doing, we don't like what they're into, and we don't have to, but we have to accept them. It's the thing I was talking about earlier, really. I love you no matter what you do. I don't agree with you on everything. And I don't like everything, but I love you. I accept you. You are my son and my daughter. You see, this is, this is, the, this is what God does for us. We, di we may disappoint God, but we're still his children. If we put our faith in Christ, we're still his children. We can be disobedient children, but we're still his children. The Bible says we're accepted in Christ he accepts us because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And acceptance is a big part of love. And then the third is nurture. And this is where the love language thing, I think, really, really zeroes in on. It's nurture is to feed. It's feeding the, the heart of that child. Now, if you look at the opposite of these three things, you're looking at, uh, at a child that has deep, deep trouble. The opposite of connection is abandonment. And this is why children who go through the divorce of their parents struggle far more in feeling loved than do children whose parents stay together. Particularly if the non-custodial parent has very little time with that child. And as you know, in our culture, we often have a situation where the non-custodial parent is not even around. It's abandonment, I mean, they feel abandoned. Uh, and then the opposite of acceptance is rejection. The sense that my parents don't like me, my parents wish I were not their child. It's that sense of being rejected. It's the opposite of acceptance. And then the opposite of nurture is abuse. Either physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse. And you put those three things together if the child has a sense of being abandoned, a sense of being rejected, and, a, and, and, is, and is abused, 
you have got a child that's going to have deep, deep, deep trouble emotionally, physically, spiritually in every area. And that's why what we're talking about tonight is so important. It's not everything about child rearing, but keeping a child's love tank full and the child having that sense that my mother, my mother and my father love me and they're there for me and they accept me and they're glad that I'm their child. And I know that even when I disappoint them, they still love me and they're still going to be there for me. That provides the greatest sense of security for a child, whether they're a teenager or whether they're an elementary age child. One of the things that has surprised uh, Dr. Campbell and I, uh, because we wrote this book for parents, is that many public schools are now using this book in teacher workshops because teachers know that if children feel loved by the teacher, they will learn more from the teacher. So this has a tremendous impact on learning. It also has a tremendous impact on the child's anger level. If a child feels loved by the parents, they will experience less anger. If they don't feel loved, they will experience more anger. There's something inside a child that says, my parents should love me. And when they don't feel loved by the parents, the emotion of anger arises in the child. So we, we just really believe this is a significant, uh, significant concept. I just wanted to say also a word about this book, particularly tonight, because you, you are families. Uh, it's called The Family You've Always Wanted. You know, we've talked so much about dysfunctional families for the last 20 years that people have no concept of what a healthy family looks like. Almost everybody who walks into my office thinks they grew up in a dysfunctional family. In fact, they all, well, they'll often start out that way and say, you know, Dr. Chapman, I grew up in a dysfunctional family, and they go on to tell me about it. So what I did, I wrote a book on what a healthy family looks like. In a healthy family, there will be an attitude of service. The husband will serve the wife. The wife will serve him. They will serve the children. The children will learn to grow, to grow up to serve the parents and serve each other. And the whole family will serve outside the family. That's a healthy family. In a healthy family, there will be intimacy between the husband and wife. Intellectual, social, emotional, intellectual, spiritual intimacy between a husband and wife. In a healthy family, that's what it's like. There will be a deep intimacy. In a healthy family, the parents will teach and train the children. Those are two very different words. They're biblical words, teach and train. One is words, one is actions. We tell them some things, but we also show them some things. In a healthy family, we'll be teaching and training the children. In a healthy family, the children will be obeying and honoring their parents. Obedience always comes before honor. Not that difficult to teach children to obey. If you let them suffer the consequences of doing wrong, they learn to obey. And, 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 but in a healthy family, that's what you'll see. There'll be, there'll be, uh, yeah. Okay, so five fundamentals of a healthy family. The book is literally filled with ideas on how to build those five factors into your marriage and family. And then uh, in this little packet, they've also put 101 conversation starters for families. You flip the book open, there's a question there that for, the, for mom and dad and the kids to answer. Uh, questions that will help you tell things about yourself. Uh, it just, the kids will love it, even your teenagers will love it, because they love to hear you tell things that they don't know about you, okay? So anyway, uh, and I'm grateful that uh, Moody Publishers has, uh, is selling these at a super discount. You've got the little cards there, so I hope you'll take advantage of that tonight. Well, let me uh, thank you, and maybe, uh, Justin's going to come up, but maybe uh, I could just pray for you for a minute. And uh, if you're with your spouse, maybe you could hold hands. Yeah. If you're by yourself, hold your own hand. <laughs> and let's pray. Father, thank you that in your divine providence, you've allowed us to spend a few minutes together tonight reflecting on our children. Father, you know that those of us who are in this place love our children and we want our children to feel loved. So I pray that what we've shared tonight you will use to help us be more effective in doing what we really want to do and that is fill the emotional need of our children for love. 
And I pray that you will also remind us that we as adults need love and that if we're married, the person we would most like to love us is our spouse. So may we learn to apply this and learn to speak each other's language in our marriages so that we also operate with a full love tank. We thank you that you love us. We thank you for the deep security that brings. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.